All right, we're ready to roll? Okay, yeah. Thank okay, you. thanks. Thanks, thanks Steve. Hi, um, so I'm Alana Fitzgerald. This is Terry Edwards. Um, we've done a, um, an OER cascade at Durham University with four teachers. Um, two of the other teachers couldn't make it. Um, so Terry and I will have a conversation about our experience um, doing this OER cascade at Durham. Okay, just to give you a, a quick overview, um, we'll talk briefly to you about the training that we did with um, particularly corporate and text analysis tools for English language teaching. And then I'll give you a really, really quick overview of the tools. The internet connection, I'm afraid, is a little bit slow, so I'm going to um, really minimize the time for demos. Um, and then we'll talk about the feedback on this training program and also the feed forward and different, different groups, stakeholder groups that we'll be working with um, in future. All right, so um, Terry, what were your expectations about the OER cascade and, and what was the reality like? Well, um, I didn't really know what to expect when we started the project, but um, what we felt we needed were some kind of tools that students could use um, to improve their writing skills. Our students, particularly on our year-round program, often come in at quite low level and um, they need to improve vocabulary, they need to improve their writing skills. So we were hoping to find some way of showing them how to do that. And that, yeah, that was it really. Thank you. So we had two different co cohorts. We've got a year-round um, program, which Terry, Terry is on. Please come on in. Um, you might have to sit on the floor. There is yeah. a seat here. I don't know if I've upset everyone. <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple of seats in here as well, if you just want to sort of shimmy on down. Okay, so two different cohorts um, this year round class, and we, you see them on a sort of almost day to day basis. And so Terry has a good idea of what their assessments are. But we also had another cohort where students that, that are already on their degree programs at Durham can just sign up for these training courses um, with free resources for helping them with their language um, learning, specifically their um, vocabulary, reading, and writing. Any further to add to that? Um, just that it was a very interesting experience from the teachers and students' point of view and definitely worth doing and I hope you'll carry on doing it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and also the other thing is possibly that we don't get a lot of time to teach language level um, Vocabulary, vocabulary, sentence level grammar, yeah. that sort of thing tends to get a bit neglected. We do a yeah. lot of sort of macro structure teaching. Yeah, how to develop your argument, introduction, conclusion, that sort of thing. Um, so this is really trying to develop students' training with tools for outside classroom use as well. Okay, so the first tool that I'll introduce <coughs> you to is FLAX. It's called the Flexible Language Acquisition Project. And um, we did develop these training videos for students, but once they were in the labs with us, we found that they were just sort of not sort of really paying attention or going at very different paces. So videos we think are great for um, self-instruction outside of the classroom. So we started to break it down into slideshows um, and just very, very simply say, you know, this is where you find it on Google. If you just type in flex, you know, what are you going to find? probably flaxseed oil, um, flax mm. the plant, so you've just got to put in flax language and that will take you to the site. Um, flax is built on digital library software, so we're talking about libraries here and collections. In, um, in the world of corpus linguistics we would be talking about maybe text archives and corpora, so it's just slightly different um, vocabulary. I'm going to take you into Flex really quickly just to show you what it's like. Um, so here we have the home page. You go into the library section. Um, here's a collection that they've been building recently called Learning Collocations. Are people familiar with what a collocation is? No. Okay. No. Kate, you are. Would you like to tell the group what a collocation is? <laughs> yeah, it's words that go together. So would you say a white and black TV or a black and white TV? Black and white. But if you were Spanish, you would probably say it the other way around. So collocation is really about this um, understanding of how native speakers put the language together. And it's a huge challenge 
for students of that target language. So you can learn all the grammar you like, um, but actually there are hundreds of thousands of collocational possibilities, and that's a huge, huge challenge for our students. So this collection, Learning Collocations, has a very, very simple interface, and here we have three different corpora. So we've used the BNC. So, Melissa, do you remember what the BNC stands for? British the British National Corpus, um, which is um, housed at the British Library, but also managed by Oxford Text Archive. We've got the BOR. Do you remember what that one was, <laughs> Terry? <laughs> okay, it's the British Academic. <laughs> yes, exactly. The um, British Academic Written English Corpus, and that's the corpus of student writing. So, whereas the BNC is professional published writing. The bore is student writing, so we're trying to um, create context where students can see what would other UK university students be writing that's possibly at a more attainable level for them, and also what is published writing like. And, and then we've got Wikipedia as a corpus as well. So if you just type in um, a word like economy, um, students can check. So we're going to check the BNC first. A little bit slow. Okay, and this is what Flex does. It will sort the language out by um, part of speech, so noun, adjective, and then it's got these related collocations. So, for example, we've got the market economy. Just click on that, and then it drills down to more levels within the BNC um, enterprise. Sorry, it's a little bit, a little bit slow here. Okay, so you can drill down and find examples and context. We have these little, um, this little cherry icon. It's not from the slot machines. Um, it's actually for students to cherry pick, and then they can add by clicking on the cherry icon. They can add a collocation. Okay, that's just the way it's coming up, and then they can go with a little flashing um, cherry icon now. And they look in their cherry basket and it's collecting phrases in context. So the idea is that students can quickly search for useful language that they could then um, transfer into their productive language tasks, so writing and speaking. Um, it's so incredibly useful because this is generally what dictionaries can't do. Yeah. Um, you know, for our students, this is the biggest problem. They'll look up a single word in a dictionary, but they don't tend to see the words around it. Yeah. And to see them in context like that, it's fantastic. And it's very quick and it's very powerful. It's more powerful than a dictionary. Yeah. The, sh the, the terrible thing is that as teachers, we're all trained how to use dictionaries, how to exploit dictionaries in our language teaching but we're not trained in corpus tools. Um, because up until recently, we haven't had these freeware programs that enable us to access these resources. And, and before FLAX, we had very difficult interfaces, which were designed more for the expert corpus linguist. Well, then they were charged. Um, for yeah. example, the Birmingham Cobell corpus, which was originally free, yeah. um, now is, is yeah, yeah, you have to pay a subscription. Not anymore. <laughs> yeah. It's very expensive to So, um, just to show you something else really quickly. So, we've been, just when I was back in New Zealand, um, we got permission from, once again, from the Oxford Text Archive to use the Bohr corpus. And this is student writing from the UK. Um, and now we've started putting it into FLAX. Uh, so, here we've got the physical sciences. Um, we're just going to browse. And we've, we've divided the, the writing genre. So you've got uh, case studies, critiques, design specs. So this is the way the corpus has been organized in terms of metadata. But here we can actually give the students those types of texts. And um, they can go through them and analyze um, the different linguistic functions. So that's probably all I'll say about FLAX today. You can go, you're free to go and um, play around with it. We're still developing it. Um, at the moment, I'm developing an open access published corpus because I want to use more open content in FLAX um, where it's not only the text analysis tools going over the top of these texts, 
but I'd actually like um, teachers to be able to take those texts and chop them up and make them into learning activities for their classrooms, which are much more at the discourse level, so above the phrase and collocation level that we've just shown you here. <coughs> okay. Okay, so here in the PPT, I've just got what I've showed you. Um, this is getting to another um, open project called the Lex Tutor. Now, this is, has a lot of great tools, <laughs> but I think, I mean, what was your first impression of this? The first time I looked at it, yeah. I was horrified. I thought, what do you do with that? <laughs> but yeah. um, the students loved it. So <laughs> Once you get down, once you know how to use it, I mean, yeah. it's all an issue of training. And unfortunately, we don't have this training as teachers. Um, and therefore, our students don't necessarily have this training either. And if the teachers have a block, that's going to create a block for the students. So really, this project is about opening up um, in terms of what we know about these tools and how to use them. Um, Once you've been shown, it's actually very simple. Yeah. But when you look at that, you just think, yeah. what is it? I mean, I'm in discussion with developers of both tools, both Flex. So <coughs> Flex, they really want to make it easy. They, w they want people to just be able to put keywords in there and look for text in a very simple way. Um, Tom Cobb, who's the developer of LexTutor, he wants to raise the bar of teacher training and he wants people to engage with, you know, what is an n-gram or how do you do hypertext um, search analyses and so on. Um, so the, the tool that we looked at was Vocab Profile and here what I've done is I've just taken an abstract from a published paper and I've put it through this vocab analysis tool in LexTutor. And you'll notice that the words are in different colours. Um, the yellow words belong to what we call the AWL, which stands for the Academic Word List. Um, and this is based on research taking um, papers from all um, subject areas in the academic world and realising that there is this group of words, this list of words that occur in all different subject areas. And so if our students can master that list, and this doesn't mean just learning the list, it means learning the collocations of those words, um, learning the different inflections and um, forms of those words, that they will do better as readers and writers of the target language. Okay, so normally you have this benchmark of 10%. So if there are 10% of yellow words, um, chances are most definitely this text has come from an academic um, discipline. So here I've got a student sample and you'll see that the yellow words <coughs> tend to be this word economic over and over again. Um, so a lot of uh, redundancy and a lot of inflexibility with academic words. The red words are what we call off-list words and they would be in your subject area. Um, so this student is talking about superpowers, China and India, um, so that's why they come up as that. So notice that the student has only come in at 6.6%. Um, did you have anything to say about how motivating this well, was? Well, um, once they figured out what they had to do, which is basically just upload text and then it calculates this, yeah. they were uploading it before Alana had even actually demonstrated <laughs> it. <laughs> and they got the idea very fast and they all wanted to see, you know, yeah. had they got 10% in their most yes. recent essay. Yes. So it was fantastically motivating. Yes. And look, this is really <laughs> not an issue with non-native speakers. We, we had um, in our MAT soul group, British students yeah. uploading their essays and getting 6% mm -hmm. and thinking, oops, you know, I really need to make my um, vocabulary, my Lexus, uh, okay. a lot more academic. So, so within the Lex Tutor, you've got this re-VP, so it means to re-vocab profile the text. So you can actually enter into the website interface new words. So what, you, what we were getting the students to do was to consult the academic word list and then try and build up um, an abstract. That, that was a little bit difficult to do. Yes. Teacher to sort of yes. point them in the right direction. Yeah, and that, that, was, that was part of the but feedback. They all tried and they yeah. all really loved it. It was, yeah. that was an absolute hit, that one. <laughs> I, I think that was the feedback from Jeff. Like, why can't we have the academic word list right there within the tool? Yes. That and yes. Hi. I'm doing hand up. I have yes. two questions. Sure. What are the blue words? 
the blue, oh sorry, the blue and the green words are um, the 2,000 most common words in English. Sort of basic English. Yes, yeah, so, so it comes from what we call the general service list. And so the academic word list is built on top of the general service list. So yes, blue and green, we need them because they're the glue in language. Like you don't want to get your yellow words up to 50%, but because then your language will be too dense. Okay, so we do have to tell our students that as well because <laughs> they're quite, you know, focused on numbers. Yes. <laughs> so 10% is enough and 20% is usually the ceiling. Um, um, but yes, that's what the blue and green words are. That was are. my second question. Is that is there an upper limit? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, people suddenly, you know, they quickly figure out, oh, how to manipulate the numbers, you know, just put the same word, like, a whole bunch of times. So, um, you know, with these R exercises to get students thinking about academic register, really. Okay. If you're worried at the, at, the, at the sort of upper limit level, there is something called the fog index. Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Which allows you to calculate, you know, how dense your text is. And if it goes two, above... Two Gs in fog. Um, only the one. <laughs> it's a mathematical okay. calculation. All right, great, thank you. It's somewhere online, you can check it out. Okay, so what we, what we asked them to do was go back to consult the academic word list, like what types of words have the same meaning as what you're trying to express here? And then they started to come up with, with this, uh, which was a lot tighter. Okay, the last tool um, that we worked with was AntConk, and this is a also a freeware based at Waseda University in Tokyo and um, it's called AntConk because it was developed by a guy called Anthony and it's a concordancing freeware. He has these um, training videos which are uploaded onto YouTube. I have been in discussion with him about okay but then you know people in China can't access this and they would really benefit from this so how about putting it just on your university website. Um, so Really, I guess a lot of my project is how can I promote these tools and show people where different channels of openness are um, for pushing these tools out there. So I don't know if you can see um, the finer granularity there, but that is your typical concordancing interface. And a lot of teachers would be put off by that. So it seems better to move from Flax to LexTutor to AntConk. We had our students right up to tutorial number nine with AntConk in a space of four weeks and they were able to build their own corpora um, so building in a collection of texts that they would be reading in their subject areas be that law or economics or business finance and they were able to identify the red words beyond the academic word list so those are the specific words in their subject area that they really need to be getting and the phrases around those words as well. For those of you who haven't seen this kind of concordancing tool, basically the key word goes down the middle and the sentences around it, but yes. it's sentence fragments. Yes. So again, for a student, it's very hard to work out what the, stu what the sentence actually yeah. should be yeah. or where it comes from. You can't really tell the source <coughs> yeah. very easily unless you have, have some knowledge of linguistics. Most of my students don't. Yes, that's true. But we find our um, science students do better with this. Yes. They're, they're yeah. more comfortable with this type of data um, display and presentation. They're not put off by it. I think and in some it, yeah, I think in some ways it's the teachers who are more put off by yeah, it. So true. once again, we don't want the teachers to block them from the tools. Okay, so um, a couple of weeks ago I was in Bologna <coughs> um, at an OER for languages conferences, and Russell Stannard is a big um, promoter of OER within the ELT field and he, you know, I've, I've made my own little demo videos on YouTube and stuff um, but definitely he's a far greater open channel to work with and he's going to be developing Flax demo videos with me and then later Lex Tutor. so we're going to try and push this out there into um, the ELT world in this way um, so we'll be working with Russell Stannard Oh, and sorry, I'll just go back to my first slide. Oopsie daisy. This one here. Okay, just to wrap up. Um, so, just to talk about this really quickly, um, design-based research, which probably most of us are familiar with in the ed tech world, in the teaching world, especially in the language teaching world as well, we are familiar with what's called action research. 
Um, so Terry, do you want to just speak to Action Research a little bit? Action Research basically takes place in your classroom. It's where you have a hypothesis that you want to test out with your students. You mm -hmm. know, can students do this? Or how do we teach this? And you actually do it. Um, I've never seen it described like this. This is much more in your field. Okay, <laughs> so, you. okay. so Terry, Terry Anderson described <laughs> design-based research as action research on steroids, yes. <laughs> uh, which I found, I found quite, um, quite novel. So what we're doing here, it is an action research cycle where we're bringing an intervention, we're bringing tools and training into the lab, into the classroom. But a, a further step to that is we are engaging the students and the teachers to feedback on the design of the tools. So that's very much the relationship I have with the people in New Zealand who are developing FLAX and also Lex Tutor, I mean that is based out of my university in Canada and now I've, I'm talking with this guy, Ant, Anthony of Ant Conk. So I think this is probably a new experience for the teachers and students, knowing that their feedback counts and that we're going to try and change things based on their experience of the tools. And over the next year I will be travelling a lot and I'll be um, helping the OERU with developing their composition um, course that they're developing because there is going to be a need for language support. If we're going to do these OER um, courses in English and in future in other languages, we're going to need language support and tools like this can run over the top of any open text that students might be engaging with um, to help them um, to further support. Yes. Okay, great. Terry, you wanted to... <coughs> Um, I'd just really like to say that from a sort of student point of view, I think they all found this very interesting and very useful. And I thought the most interesting thing that was said by one of the students was, um, oh, this is going to be really helpful when I start my actual course. Yes. And I thought, yes, that's what we want. We want to give them something they can take away and use by themselves. Yes. Um, because, yeah, a lot of our students don't have good search skills. They're not... Yeah. You know, very good with technology. And we did have <laughs> as well. that one student in your class, Har yeah. Harry, who said, why didn't we learn this on the first day yes. of, our, yes. of our class last year? Yes, that's right. Um, yeah. And when I, as I continue to work with the Language Centre at Durham, um, it will be much more about, you know, I think um, Rory McGrail used this great term the other day in the workshop saying about deboning existing courses, so taking out the proprietary content and putting in open content. So we're going to work with open texts in the classroom mm -hmm. yeah. and then have these open tools for them to be working with um, in lab training sessions so that they can then um, continue this work in their own time as students working by themselves once they go on to their degree programs to, um, you know, deal with all this reading that they have to, um, you know, for their PhD or uh, master's work or even undergraduate work as well. So that's, and Barleaf is the um, EAP English for Academic Purposes community here in the UK which is trying to have much more of an international impact by sharing resources for teaching um, at the college level for composition and so on. So we'll be working with them as well. So try and join it all up, really, don't we? Yeah, I mean, the and, and for us, you know, whoever wants to use these and remix them and um, feedback into the research mm -hmm. design circle, that would, cycle, that would be great. Okay, so that's, that's pretty much it. Any questions from the audience? Yes. So a student has an essay. Yes. They download it <coughs> to the Flex program, yeah. and then what, they press some buttons? So yeah. Something, something I, to direct to the it, next tutor. That, that, that was the Lex Tutor. Um, within this slideshow, which you'll have on the website, there is actually a demonstration video um, which you can take a look at, which shows you how to do it. Um, this one here is actually, I've put it onto YouTube, and it shows you exactly how to use the vocab profile tool. Okay, no problem. Anybody else? Okay, yes. Um, Terry McAndrew from Techlis. Accessibility challenges and gains with software like this, uh, dyslexic students, for example. Yes, that's why. That's one reason why I didn't like this yeah. colour scheme. To be perfectly honest, yes, um, because I am very aware that some of our students have very poor text processing <laughs> skills. And mm. when I looked at it, I thought, whoa! Um, I, I prefer yeah. to see it in a different colour. So yeah, yeah, but, but yeah. not just in terms of its presentation. Yeah. I mean, helping them understand 
Yeah, I, th I think that that hasn't been done yet. Yeah. And if you would like to work with us um, to yeah. make it more accessible, that would be great. Yeah, so that is definitely a consideration that hasn't been um, dealt with at all for any of these tools. Yeah. yeah. Limitations for people with a colour blind? Mm. <laughs> I would <Absolutely>. think so. <laughs> I would think so. Yeah. yeah, I mean, personally, the next chair, I mean, he's. He's been developing his project for 20 years and he's well known in the field. Um, but personally, I think he's got a bit of a block when it comes to accessibility and training. He expects you to just get in there, get your hands dirty and get good with it, which is what I've done, but it's taken me a bit of time. And I don't think all teachers are willing to invest that time. So I think the Flex model, they're open source software developers. They're a little bit more up to date with uh, making things more accessible. Yeah, Melissa. You might want to say um, something about whether we've managed to progress, but um, one of the things that this project um, caused me to have to do is to revisit the British National Corpus, which is something that Oxford holds, which wasn't an open educational resource no. collection, but this was quite nice about open educational resource projects, is that Alana asking, can we interact with the corpus in this way? has caused us to have to revisit it, look at its license, figure out whether it's possible to go back into the history of the BNC and yes. try to open it up yes. in that way. So we're op attempting to open up collections that would previously have been for research only in as open educational resources because the teacher is asking these mm -hmm. questions, saying, I would like to use this in yes. teaching in an open way, can you let me have access? Yes. Have we managed to, yes, to well, meet I've, you there? Yes, you have. Ten seconds. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you, yes, because when it comes down to text analysis tools, they're running over the top of a corpus, so it doesn't matter if it's proprietary. Um, but it's great that you've given us the ability to build it into an open platform. Um, that's why I want to build the open access published corpus as well, so then teachers can actually grab those texts and start pulling them out of the corpus as well. But yes, I mean, Oxford's been great, and also the permission to use the bore as well, because I don't think it's what the original developers envisioned, um, but it's much more um, within teaching and learning now, which is, which is really great for our community of teachers and students. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.